continue our secrets of happy and fulfilled life. The secret number four is measure in major things. You know Thomas Edison, how many of you know of Thomas Edison? He was once asked, I mean this is a guy who has been probably the most prolific inventors of all time. In the US alone, he has some uh, 1,093 patents to his name. And someone once asked him, what is your secret to success? And when he said something so beautiful, and it really captures the essence of this secret, he said, most people wake up in the morning and do many things. I just do a few. He said, most people wake up in the morning and do many things. I just do a few. When he woke up, he focused all his time, all his effort, all his energy on the few things that matter to him the most. A lot of us have so many things going in our lives. We are measuring in so many minor projects, minor events. How do we measure in the major things? You know, a lot of times when I ask people about why are they not following their bliss, why are they not going after their passion, the first thing I hear from them is, Malik, I just don't have time. I mean, between my responsibilities at work and uh, at home, I have no time. I'm running out of time. I wish I had more than 24 hours in a day. So before I kind of tell you how do you create more time on your schedule to follow your bliss, I will tell you another story. And this time, it's a story about a young boy named Roy Torrentira. We heard the story early on of Janet Bellarmino, an ordinary Filipina who went on doing extraordinary things. I'm going to talk about one more story of an ordinary Filipino who has done amazing things already in his life. Roy Torrentira, he was born in a very small barangay in the hole, thousand people, and he was born into a very poor family. He was one of the nine kids his parents had. Luckily, he was the best one in the school, so his parents kept telling him that, son, if you want to do something with your life, if you want to come out of this poverty, if you want to take your family out of this dire poverty, do something with your education. Don't give up on education. So he knew that he wanted to do something really good with himself. When he was around 10 years old, police came into his house and arrested his dad for no reason and took him away. That event left a lasting impression on him. A few months later, he decided that he wanted to become a lawyer because he wants to find out more about the law of the land and to make sure that other poor families are not suffering from the abuses of the authority. The problem was his family can only afford to pay for his high school. But Roy didn't give up. He found a full-time job as a houseboy and registered in one of the universities in the hall for his bachelor's degree. He finished his undergrad degree, but could not find a job in the hall. So he decided to pack his bags with little money he had and a few copies of his transcripts and his degree, he arrives in Manila in 2004. Here too, he's not able to find the right job. So next four years, between 2004 to 2008, Roy does all kinds of odd jobs. He starts with being an ambulant vendor, selling kitchen appliances door to door. Then he becomes a dishwasher boy. Then he becomes a car wash boy. 
Then he becomes a houseboy again, saving whatever little money he has for himself and his education, but also sending it back home. In 2008, one of his friends tells him that if you really want to make some money while you're saving for your law school, maybe you should consider being a taxi driver. So Roy becomes a full-time taxi driver in 2008, and with little money that he had saved by then, he registers at the Adamson University for the law school. Between 2008 and 2012, Roy is a full-time taxi driver and a full-time law student. He takes his bar in October of 2012, and a year ago, just around this time, he passed his bar. He became the attorney at law. Taxi driver becoming a lawyer. Taxi driver majoring in the most major thing he had been dreaming about. We are so lucky to have attorney Roy Torrentila with us today. You can please come on stage. I had a lunch with Roy just to prepare him for this uh, event, and he's one humble, one low-key person, so he's a bit concerned about coming on stage in front of this many people, but I know that his story is so inspiring that it doesn't matter whether he says anything here or not. It's going to inspire us just to look at him and hear his story. So one thing I want to hear from you, attorney, is how did you manage your time? This secret that we are talking about now, measuring in major things, is that about finding time to follow your passion and your dreams. And your dream has always been being a lawyer. Yes, Mali. So how did you find time being a full-time taxi driver and a full-time student? Tell me about how did that work out? Um, uh, I will first have to discuss the job or the routine of a taxi driver. Uh, as we all know, taxi drivers, most in the Philippines, are full, uh, 24, working 24 hours a day so we, we wake up at 4 in the morning and then end our task at 4, the ne 4 a.m. The, the next day. So managing my time while I was a taxi driver and as well working as, a, as well studying in law school is very difficult. You know, I have to stop, uh, I have to stop driving and earning money and uh, I, have, I need to go to school. So I have to park my car outside the university and attend to class. And while I was driving, I have to study. I bring with me, yes, I bring with me uh, reviewers, my school notes, and while uh, the cab is on, the, in, is on the stoplight, I will have to review. So that when my class in the evening comes, so I have prepared already, I can recite, I can answer questions, and I can, uh, I know, I am prepared. But then uh, the next day, uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult because uh, I, I lack sleep. So I have only sleep uh, two to three hours a day just working as a taxi driver. And the next day, I have to regain my strength because I have no work at day, uh, on that day. So uh, first thing in the morning, I have to take a rest and at eight or so. I have to go to the library because I have to study there. I have no books. I didn't buy, I didn't buy any book because I have no money. And I make that library as my second home because I rented the, a big space at uh, Ermita. And since I cannot study home, I have to study at the library and make it as my second home. And then uh, that's it. No. No vices, no night outs with friends. I have to focus on my job and no girlfriend. How about now? I, now uh, <laughs> I have to attend to my uh, job as a lawyer. By the way, he recently got married and uh, they, his uh, and his wife are pregnant. 
with uh, twins. Yes, Malik. And everything is okay? Everything is okay. Okay. One last thing I want him to share with us, a very fascinating story. Here, Roy, coming from a very poor family, if anybody were in his situation, the first thing they would say, you know what, I have suffered a lot, my family has suffered a lot, I'm a lawyer, I'm going to find the best job and start making money. But every week, you spend some time at the university. Please tell us, what do you do at the university? Uh, I'm working at the Legal Aid Office of Adamson University. I'm handling cases in court, uh, pro bono, without any compensation. Uh, aside from that, more like, uh, as I have uh, talked to you last time, I have also helped this non-government organization on their free, uh, with a free legal counseling every week. So it's on a Saturday, and I also handled cases for them. Great. Well, any of these people come to you, don't give them pre bono. I think they all can, <laughs> they can all afford it. I think so. All right. Thank you once again, <laughs> Attorney Roy. Really appreciate Thank it. Please. Thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to kind of highlight this story because uh, sometimes we only look up to people like Mani Pacquiao's and the ones who are in the show business, but there are so many role models around us and we don't have to look for, too far. And sometimes when we are listening to the radio news or when we are watching TV news or when we are reading news in the newspaper, we are so busy with uh, all the showbiz chismes, no, you know? Uh, who is Chris Aquino dating and what kind of questions Bimbi is asking and the Juan Navarro and the Denise Cornejo thing. But there are so many stories in the same newspapers. They are so inspiring. And the reason and the how we actually met uh, Roy, it was a story that was sent to me by my colleague Renji here. And said, Malik, you are working on this uh, event to inspire people on how to manage your time. Maybe you want to talk to Roy Torantira, attorney Roy Torantira, because he has done something remarkable. And we tracked him down, and we were able to actually get him on here. So keep in mind that you, know, you can also do amazing things. You have to keep your vices and uh, life in check, but you can actually achieve your goals. There are four things I want to talk about that you can do to increase more time on your schedule, which you can use to follow your bliss. The first one is look at your life and look at all the minor projects or events you're working on. You know, when Steve Jobs came back to Apple in 1997 as a CEO, one of the first things he did was to reduce the number of projects and products Apple was working on from 50 to 10. He met with all these project managers and product managers and decided that not all the 50 products are gonna make Apple some money. So he chose only the 10 major ones. The same principle applies in our lives. Just do a quick math in your head. How many projects and events hobbies you're working on, and do you really need to work on all of them? Choose the major 10 or so that would work in your life. Choose the major projects that would actually help you to achieve your goals in life. So number one is look at your life and remove all the minor projects. Make sure you're measuring in the major things. Number two, look at how many things you are doing that you could de delegate to someone else. Not only at work, but also at home. List down all the things that you are working on today that someone else can do it for you so that you are spending your time where you can make the most impact. Number three, how much time are you spending with people you don't trust or you can't rely on? Now don't read that down because maybe that person is sitting right next to you. Maybe your boss like, geez, yeah, that's the guy right next to me here. But 
sometimes because of the society pressures and the pressures from our peers, we end up hanging out with people we couldn't care less about. We have nothing in common. Ask yourself how much time you're spending in your life with people you don't trust and can't rely on. And use that time for something more productive following your bliss. And the last one is, how much time are you spending trying to change things you don't control? How many things, how many things you are working on that you have no control over? How much time are you spending trying to change something that you don't control? People or events, how many of you have tried to change your spouse? Or a girlfriend or a boyfriend? Doesn't work, Buddha? So use that time on the things you control. Use that time for following your bliss. So again, secret number four, very important. You gotta have time to follow your bliss. And you have to manage time as the most precious commodity you have on your plate. Secret number five is embrace the courage zone. And the courage zone is right outside of your comfort zone. And if someone were to ask me, Malik, which one is the most difficult secret to master, I would say it is embracing your courage zone because it takes courage, it takes an effort to come out of your comfort zone. We all want to be in the middle of our comfort zone, right? So it takes a lot of effort and courage to get out of your comfort zone going into the courage zone. So I'll share with you why it is worth your while to be constantly getting out of your comfort zone, not only in your professional life, but across your personal life as well as across your hobbies. So there are two studies I want to share with you. The first one was done by a small school in the US. It's called uh, Babson College out of Boston, Massachusetts. How many of you have heard of that school? We got a few people who have heard of that school. It's a very, very small school, and its claim to fame is it's number one in entrepreneurship. So if you want to hear or learn anything about entrepreneurship, starting a new business, this is the school to go to. Now the faculty there looked at their graduates over the years, and they found out that not everybody who has graduated from Babson College with the degree in entrepreneurship was able to start a new business. Only a fraction of the students were able to start a new business. So they wanted to find out what differentiates the people who were able to use their degree and start the new business versus the ones who failed to be entrepreneurial in their life. They did a 12-year study and they found out that the number one differentiating factor was the ones who were successful had absolutely no problem getting out of their comfort zone or trying new things without the guarantee of success. They kept on trying new things. They failed sometimes, but then they hit a jackpot. But the ones who failed, they were just happy being in their comfort zone. They didn't want to push themselves out of the comfort zone. They didn't want to do something they had no idea about. The second study was done by this young guy. His name is uh, Marcus Taylor. And he started this really cool website. It's called the What's mycomfortzone.com. It's an amazing website. After this, not now, because I know some of you have iPads. When you're at home, just go to the website. Within 10 minutes of taking you through some 20 plus questions, instantly it gives you your comfort zone score from zero to 100%. 
And the higher the comfort zone score, the better you are in being able to embrace your color zone. He wanted to find out if there was any correlation between people's ability to get out of their comfort zone and their annual income. So he looked at data across some thousands of people who have attended and visited his website, and he asked for some annual income data points from them. And what he found was quite fascinating. There is a direct correlation between your ability to get out of the comfort zone on a regular basis and your annual income. The higher your comfort zone score, higher your annual income. So if you are looking at just simply not even following your bliss but making more money, this is a secret that you really want to master. I will share with you a couple of examples of the people who I believe are great examples of mastering this secret. The first one is MVP, Manny Pangilinan. He has been my role model for the last four years since I started working for him in 2009. And I look up to him. And before I started working for him, I always wondered, how did Manny go from uh, this humble beginning that he came from to being at the top of the first Pacific food chain? What differentiates him? And more I got to know him, more I observed him in the meetings, more I heard about him from other people who have known him for many years, I found out that one thing that really differentiates Manny and MVP is his ability to fearlessly try new things. You know, his first investment in the Philippines, does anybody know what did he invest in? The first investment from MVP and for specific group in the Philippines. Pardon? Bottle water, but before that it was the PLDT and Smart. In the mid-90s, that's what he got into. Now before buying PLDT and Smart, he didn't know anything about the telco business. He had never run a business in the Philippines. But he did not feared from the fact that he didn't know anything about the Philippines or the fact that he didn't know anything about telco business. He went in and bought it. He learned everything he could about the business, and he turned it around. Since then, he has bought what? Water company here. He owns tollways, TV station, a BPO company. Pardon? Hospitals. Everybody's thinking about hospitals here. So many different businesses. If you think about it, he didn't know anything about running a hospital business. He didn't know anything about running a water business. He didn't know anything about BPO business, TV station. But that didn't stop him from learning about this business, getting out of his comfort zone, and buying new things and learning about it. But the beautiful thing about Manny and all these successful people is that they're not just pushing themselves out of the comfort zone only in their vocation in their professional life. They do the same thing across everything they do. One of these others is badminton. Manny is 67 years old, and he still plays badminton at least three times a week. And guess who he plays with? Not me. <laughs> I would be a lot fitter if that was the case, but no, not me. He plays with the national badminton champions. And I asked him, boss, why are you playing with the national badminton champions? And he said, no, if I want to be better than I was yesterday, I have to play with someone who is better than me. Look at the life philosophy from this guy. No wonder he's sitting at the top of the food chain in First Pacific. So you see an example of Manny who is constantly pushing his comfort zone in whatever he does in his professional life as well as in his personal life. The second example I want to give you is Manny Pacquiao. I know we're all preparing for his next uh, bout with uh, Team Bradley, so can't talk enough about Manny. But look at this 
set of pictures here. None of these pictures are about his vocation, right? There's not a single picture here that includes boxing in it. Mani had never played a lead role in a film. His first film was what? Does anybody remember here? It was in 2005, Licencia Dan Camao. Licensed fit. But nobody knows it because it was a big failure commercially. And it received a lot of poor reviews from the critics. Then he did the Anak Ang Commander and then Wapak Man. And he kept failing. But the beautiful thing about the secret, it doesn't say embrace the courage zone and succeed. It just says embrace the courage zone. Keep working on your comfort zone muscles. The middle two pictures are what? What is he doing there? He's a congressman, right? He doesn't come from a political dynasty. Mommy D never ran for an office before. He didn't know anybody else in his family who had run for an office. And in fact, he didn't help to run for an office in 2007. He was making enough money, right? Why bother with politics? Somebody asked him, why are you trying to bring politics into the play? You are in the top of your game right now. You're making so much money. Enjoy life. And he said, no. Every time I go back home, when I see these poor people, I can relate to them. And I want to represent them. I want to be the voice for them in the Congress. So he pushed himself out of his comfort zone and ran for the office in 2007. Lost, but didn't give up. He ran again in 2010. And now he's the congressman. And I would not be surprised, guys, if he one day ends up becoming a senator or even the president of this country, not because I think he is qualified or disqualified or whether I agree with his political views or not. I simply say this because he constantly is pushing himself out of his comfort zone. Right? So what are some of the things you can do to improve your ability to get out of the comfort zone? I want to take you through four takeaways that you can use in your life. Number one, first of all, find out your blind spots in relation to your comfort zones. What are your blind spots? So today, when you go home, I, all of you should go and uh, visit whatsmycomfortzone.com website, and you should devote 10 minutes of your time go through some 20 plus questions and get an instant score and it will tell you what are your blind spots. It will ask you questions about your professional life, your personal life, and your adventure life. And you'll find out whether you're too much into professional life getting out of your comfort zone, but you need to work on a little bit more on your adventure life. Once you find that out, you can actually start doing something about it. It's almost like before you get to point B, you gotta know what your point A is. So find out what your blind spots are with the comfort zone. Number two, once you know your blind spots, start working on your fears one by one. What are your fears? And slowly and surely, you start working through them. I'll give you one very embarrassing personal example here. Since I knew nine months ago that um, I wanted to talk about people getting out of their comfort zone, and I wanted to do it with some moral conviction, so I thought I should take on my biggest fear. And my biggest fear always been uh, fear of drowning in uh, deep, open water bodies. Anybody who has known me for years, they would tell me or tell you that they would never see me anywhere close to any water sports. I have avoided water at all costs so far. But I was determined to overcome my fear of drowning, so I called up the Lozada School of Swimming and signed up. Little did I know that that's a school mainly for kids. <laughs> so a week later, I show up for my first class, and there isn't a single adult around 
the swimming pool. They're all kids and the teenagers. And the staff member approached me and said, so uh, make sure your kids are ready. We're about to start the class. And I'm like, no, no, no. I am the one here for the class. And he looked at me and like, oh my god, what's wrong with this guy? But anyway, I go into the swimming pool. And you know the first thing they do? How many of you have taken the formal swimming lessons here? Everybody's like, ah. Oh. Few people here. So you know what they do, right? The first thing they teach you is to go into the water, take a deep breath through your mouth, and then dip yourself in the water, and then do bubbles through your nose. Not only I was embarrassed to be like the most senior citizen there, but I was worried now that what if somebody sees me <laughs> doing bubbles with this bunch of kids around me? And hopefully nobody has seen it. If they have, they haven't come and told me about it. But luckily, after 10 classes, I finished my swimming. I was able to float. But unfortunately, I still could not do the freestyle or the backstroke. So in 10 classes, Lozada School would actually guarantee most of the people that you would learn how to do freestyle and you would learn how to do the backstroke. The only thing they could teach me was floating. So I had to sign up for the introductory class second time. And luckily, after two sets of classes, 20 classes, I did master it. And I'm so proud to say this, guys. And please applaud after this. Just last month, after six months of swimming every single day, I finished my first kilometer in the ocean without stopping. So take a couple of minutes here, guys, and write down what are the fears you'd like to overcome. And I want to have a couple of volunteers to share what fear they are signing up today to overcome over the next 12 months. Who would like to share their fear that they would like to overcome to work on your comfort zone muscles? Romel. That's what happens when you show up to the event. <laughs> okay, probably let's uh, relate that to your experience, Mualik. So uh, I've been uh, invited to dive, do scuba diving, uh, way back in 2001. And I had this f same fear as yours. I said, I don't know how to swim. You know, more so going, you know, 60 feet below water. You know, I, 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 you know, just the thought of it was, was quite scary. And in 2007, six years after that first invitation, I tried intro diving. Three months after that intro diving, I was certified for open water. And three months after that, I got certified for advanced uh, open water diving and I think the main reason really was I got really always curious and said I've just decided in 2007 what is it really that makes scuba diving fun mm -hmm. and I realized in fact I somewhat regretted that why it took me six years to finally decide and do scuba diving and now I'm enjoying it every bit. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. But you can't still swim, right? I cannot. OK, I can teach you the bubbles. <laughs> I'll charge you maybe 50% less than what Lozada School will charge you. So the third takeaway on the comfort zone is take it easy. Take it one step at a time. Sometimes you may get excited about trying to overcome your comfort zone, trying to overcome your fears, and you may make a big jump, and instead of going through the courage zone, you may end up where? In the terror zone. And I'll give you, and I'll share with you one more very embarrassing story, a personal one. How many of you have been to Macau here? Okay, how many of you 
been to the Macau Tower. And how many of you tried bungee jumping from Macau Tower? Okay, few people, everybody from teleperformance, I think. <laughs> well, five years ago, I went to Macau, and since I had never tried bungee jumping and I had a fear of height to an extent, I thought I should go to Macau Tower and uh, try to overcome that fear. So I go there, I pay for my bungee jumping, I go to the top floor, and mind you, I have never ever done bungee jumping in my, my, my life before. I pay for it, they put on this harness on me, they put on a cable, and then this big burly guy starts walking me out on the platform. And that's the first time I see the view below. And I freaked out. And my knees went weak. I mean, I was paralyzed by fear. So I literally just sat down on my knees. And I'm like, there's no way I'm going to jump off this platform. And this big burly guy is a son. Do you want to be remembered as a coward for the rest of your life? And I'm like, Daddy, I don't care what you call me. <laughs> Please get me off this platform. <laughs> and I became probably one of the very few people who go all the way on the platform and then they take this walk of shame back into the building. But what happened there? Look, I mean, I had never done bungee jumping before, and I go to the tallest bungee jumping there is in the world. I mean, Macau Tower bungee jumping is the tallest bungee jumping in the world. It's almost like jumping off a PBCOM building. I should have started jumping off from the stage, probably. That's the first step into the current zone, right? And then perhaps the top of the raffles before I go to the top of PBCOM. So when you are looking at overcoming your comfort zone, make sure you are taking it one step at a time. And the fourth takeaway with the comfort zone secret is be compassionate to yourself. When you will try to get out of your comfort zone, you will experience emotions that you typically don't experience when you are sitting pretty in the right middle of your comfort zone. When you get out of your comfort zone, that's when you're going to feel inadequate. You're going to feel scared, insecure. You'll feel like an idiot, like I did when I took the swimming classes and I could not get it done in the first 10. So you have to be very compassionate to yourself as you are pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. Also, people around you may make fun of you, right? When you fail, they make a big deal about it. You become the brunt of the joke. But don't care about those people. In fact, one of the quotes that I like a lot about uh, who you hang out with, it says, you are an average of the five people you hang out most with. Jim Ron, one of my mentors, said, you are the average of the five people you hang out the most with. So ask yourself, the five people you hang out most with, are they pushing themselves out of the comfort zone? If not, either take them with you or find the new five people who are pushing themselves out of the comfort zone. Because you're going to be surrounded by people who are constantly pushing their limit. Okay, so secret number six. Master the magic quadrant. Imagine you plot luck on the horizontal axis and outcome on the vertical axis, the luck goes from good to bad, from right to left, 
an outcome goes from good to bad, from the top to the bottom. So let's look at these four quadrants, starting clockwise, right? The first quadrant is you have good luck, and the outcome is good. That's normal. Most of the people will be able to convert good luck in a good outcome. The second quadrant is good luck, but bad outcome. How many times we hear stories about these lotto winners who squander their wins through gambling or other addiction? That's a waste because they had a good luck, but they were not able to maximize the outcome. Then you have bad luck and bad outcome. That's normal again. Most of the people who go through bad luck, they end up with bad outcome. If you're on uh, the path of a typhoon, you lose your house, that's bad luck because you're on the path of the typhoon and that bad outcome because you lost your house. But folks, where the successful people differentiate them from the masses is the fourth quadrant, and that is the magic quadrant. These are the people, they take bad luck and turn it into good outcome. I'll give you three examples. The first one is one of my heroes again, Nelson Mandela. When Nelson Mandela was 44 years old, he was imprisoned for a lifetime by the apartheid regime. Let's personalize it for a second here. How many of us are in our late 30s or 40s here? I know, sorry to do that to you guys. But just for a second, personalize this. Imagine from tomorrow onwards, you will spend the rest of your life in the prison. Not only he was imprisoned, but he was assigned to the worst prison in the South African region, the Robin Island. That's where the most hardcore criminals were sent. Not only he was sent to the worst prison, but he was categorized as Class D, which is the worst kind of a prisoner. He was assigned this seven by eight dome concrete wall in a cell. He was given a straw mat to sleep on. He was given a bucket to be used as a toilet. He was asked to work in a lime quarry, hard work, hard labor. He was only allowed one visitor for 30 minutes a year. Only two pieces of mail in 12 months. Is it a good luck or a bad luck? How many of you would say good, bad luck? The rest of you are lazy. I know you all think it's bad luck, right? But look at the outcome now. While he was at the prison, he learned a new language, Afrikaans, the language of his enemies. Someone asked him, why are you learning the language of the enemies? And he said, if you want to appeal to someone's mind, you should speak to them in the language they understand. But if you want to appeal to someone to their heart, you should speak to them in the language they speak. He knew that he was going to play a role in negotiating a new power arrangement for the people in South Africa, and he was preparing himself for that. He finished writing his autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom, one of the best biographies you can read, and an international bestseller. He finished that book while he was in the prison for 27 years. When he came out, three years later, he became the first African president of the country in 1994. Good outcome or bad outcome? 
Huh? Good outcome, right? Bad luck, but good outcome. He did not allow the bad luck to define him or destroy him. He allowed that bad luck to strengthen him. He came out stronger from the prison. He went into the prison as this angry militant. When he came out of the prison, he came out as a forgiving statesman who could lead a country to a new direction by embracing the people who imprisoned him. In fact, when he was inaugurated in 1994, he invited the same guards from the prison to be sitting in the front row. He changed himself through that process instead of defining him or destroying him in the process. The second example I want to give with you is of the author of Harry Potter. How many of you have read Harry Potter books? Yeah? How many of you have kids who have read or are reading the Harry Potter books? Almost everybody is familiar with the Harry Potter books. She has an interesting life. Five years before, she made it big with the first book in the Harry Potter series. J.K. Rowling went through a series of bad lucks. Her mother passed away, and she was very close to her mother. Her 13-month marriage ended in a divorce, and suddenly she became this single mother who was not able to find a job, so she had to go on welfare benefits in UK. Bad luck or good luck? Bad luck. But it was during that time, the darkest hour of her life, that she became so serious about writing the Harry Potter book. Today, they have sold some 400 million Harry Potter books in the world. It's been translated into some 70 different languages. Good outcome or bad outcome? So I want to share with you a video. It's a two-minute video from her commencement address in Harvard University. And the title of the speech is The Fringe Benefits of Failure. What a beautiful title. Fringe Benefits of the Failure. Just take a listen to this video. Incredibly inspiring. So I think it's fair to say that by any conventional measure, a mere seven years after my graduation day, I had failed on an epic scale. An exceptionally short-lived marriage had imploded, and I was jobless, a lone parent, and as poor as it is possible to be in modern Britain without being homeless. The fears that my parents had had for me, and that I had had for myself, had both come to pass. And by every usual standard, I was the biggest failure I knew. Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that failure is fun. That period of my life was a dark one. And I had no idea that there was going to be what the press has si since represented as a kind of fairy tale resolution. I had no idea then how far the tunnel extended. And for a long time, any light at the end of it was a hope rather than a reality. So why do I talk about the benefits of failure? Simply because failure meant a stripping away of the inessential. I stopped pretending to myself that I was anything other than what I was, and began to direct all my energy into finishing the only work that mattered to me. Had I really succeeded at anything else, I might never have found the determination to succeed in the one arena where I believed I truly belonged. I was set free because my greatest fear had been realized and I was still alive and I still had a daughter whom I adored and I had an old typewriter and a big idea. And so rock bottom became the solid foundation on which I rebuilt my life. I loved her last sentence, right? The rock bottom became the solid foundation 
on which she rebuilt her life. Different philosophy on looking at failure. The last example I want to share with you is bringing this little close to our home here in the Philippines. How many of you have heard of Jessica Cox? A few people. She was here recently in the Philippines. Her claim to fame, for those of you who haven't heard of her, is that she is the first person in the world to be a licensed pilot without arms. She was born to a Filipino mother and an American father. And because of a rare defect, she had no arms from the time of her birth. But she didn't let that define her or destroy her. It only strengthened her. She's not only the first pilot, but she is the only female in the US with two black belts in Taekwondo without arms. She plays piano without arms. She serves without arms. I will share with you a brief video of Jessica Cox, and it captures an incredibly inspiring story on how we can take bad lucks or misfortunes coming our way and turn them into positive outcome. Have a listen. I had the will to do what I wanted to do and not let anything stop me. In Filipino culture, for sure. Jessica Cox, a renowned international keynote speaker. Her life is a story of struggles and success. At 28 years old, pinapatunayan ni Jessica that sky's the limit. Iyan ang power ng Pinoy. She's an FAA certified pilot, a licensed scuba diver, a black belt in Taekwondo, a gymnast, a surfer, She's also traveled all around the world as a motivational speaker. But what really makes Jessica's story truly remarkable is she's done all this and more with no arms. This story is all about one woman's triumph of the will. Born without arms. Ipinapakita ni Jessica Cox na kaya niya magmaneho ng kotse. Kumain na walang tulong. Ang magsuot ng kanyang contact lenses. Ang mag-type ng 20 words per minute. Bibilip ka talaga kay Jessica. What we can do with our two hands, Jessica can do them with her two feet. I'm so adept to these feet. They're my hands. And if I were to wake up one day with arms and hands, it would be like you or someone with arms waking up with an extra set of arms. You wouldn't know what to do with them. I wouldn't know what to do with arms and hands because my feet are my hands, my legs are my arms. While growing up in Sierra Vista, Arizona, hindi naging madali para kay Jessica na unawangin ang kanyang kalagayan. Oftentimes I'd get angry or frustrated about it. Hindi rin ito naging madali para sa kanyang ina. My mom is devastated, which is natural. She's a mom. She had so many dreams and she immediately thought of her. How would my baby eat? How would my baby put makeup on when she gets older? When I was growing up, my mom used to worry that I wouldn't be able to do all the things I needed to do. I was the first person without arms to get a black belt in the American Taekwondo Association. I grew up with every Filipino tradition you can think of. Uh, every summer we had the Filipino fiesta, and I learned uh, to dance to Nikolini. My favorite food is pamsa. I had that from every birthday that I can remember. As a child, it was so exciting to go to the Philippines. The first trip, I was eight years old, 
And I remember it like it was yesterday because uh, we went on the motorbikes in the province. I enjoyed the tricycle. Everything was like an adventure. The only true adversity I face is acceptance from other people. I went to get my driver's license. I passed with flying colors. A week later, I got a letter in the mail saying my license was suspended. Somebody decided it wasn't safe for me to be driving without special adaptations on my car. I had to go back and take two additional tests. I still don't drive with adaptations. Everywhere you go, you're going to find people who have to pull others down. And why they need to do that? I honestly think maybe people have to pull others down to feel better about themselves. And for every bump on the road, Jessica looks up to God before taking the next step. My faith is uh, the foundation of my life. And that same faith in God and in her abilities to aim high encouraged Jessica to embark on a soaring adventure. Flying. A fighter pilot came up and asked, how would you like to fly? And I said, well, why not? And I mean, I have this fear that um, maybe this is an opportunity. And I kind of uh, prayed my prayers and, and, and uh, I went up in my first flight, on my first flight, and I remember having the experience of facing my fear, and I was like, wow, I've been building this up my whole life, and in reality, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be feared. And I remember someone told me what fear stands for. Actually, fear, F-E-A-R, stands for false evidence appearing real. The first time I flew solo was uh, the most incredible experience and it's weird because you know I had mechanical problems <laughs> obviously uh, I went through a very good training I was well prepared and my flight instructor told me that morning he said if you can give me five good landings in a row then I'm gonna get out of the plane and you can solo and so that means fly the plane by myself that morning was 6 a.m. and it was Mother's Day and I was wearing a shirt that said look ma no hands well, my instructor, he said, well, if you give me the five good landings, and sure enough, that morning I gave it to him at 6 a.m. Flying solo for the first time was a reminder to me that I'm not only pilot in command of this airplane right now, but everyone, as well as myself, I am pilot in command of my own life. Everyone is in pilot in command of their, their lives. The choices they make, they have to live with that. The decisions they make, they're going to live with that as well. Choices and decisions, those are, we are in pilot command of our own lives, and what we do now, what we say, do, and act out, that's what determines what our life is. Many normal people suffer from a true disability, a lack of faith in themselves. I hope my life story encourages other people to fulfill their true potential to overcome the handicap of fears and limitations they place on themselves, or that other people encourage in them. I want them to think, hey, if she can do that much without arms, then I can do so much more with my life. So being born without arms, good luck or bad luck? And being able to pilot a flight solo without arms, good outcome or bad outcome. So what can we learn from the people like Nelson Mandela, Jessica Cox, J.K. Rowling? I want to leave you with three takeaways for this secret that we can apply in our lives. The first thing these people do is they are very quick at accepting their reality. You know, anytime something crazy happens in our life, when a misfortune falls on us, we go through these five stages of grief and loss, right? It starts with denial. We deny if anything has changed at all. We still live in our la la land. Then comes the anger. We ask the world, why me? What did I do? Why did you choose me? as if someone is going to answer that from the universe. Then comes bargaining. We start bargaining with our universe. If 
to bring back the original situation, I will be willing to do this, this, this. But it's too late. You cannot go back. Then comes depression. When the bargaining doesn't work, you realize you're out of luck. And everything becomes bleak and dark. And then finally comes the acceptance, that you finally accept your new reality. The difference between the masses and the successful people is very simple. They all go through the five stages. The successful people just go through them very quickly. They don't get stuck in denial. They don't get stuck in anger. They don't get stuck in bargaining. They don't get stuck in depression. They go through the phases, but very quickly they come to accept their reality. So number one, ask yourself, when something bad happens to you, how quickly are you able to go through those five stages? Number two, ask yourself, how can this experience strengthen me? All of us, we go through this misfortune and sometimes we allow these misfortunes to define us or destroy us, but the successful people, they look at the same event and say, how can I be better because of this? I'll give you an example. How many of you play tennis here? I know, we got a former tennis champion here, but a few people. In 2008, Maria Sharapova was 21 years old, and she was already ranked number one in the women's tennis. But something happened that year. She had a shoulder injury. And initially she thought maybe it's just a minor inflammation, but she had to go through MRI. And she found out that she had these two big tears on the tendon on her right shoulder, the serving shoulder. So she had to take a year off. So between 2008 and 2009, her ranking goes from number one in the world to number 126. People wrote her off. All the critics and pundits thought she is never coming back because there has not been a precedent in tennis where somebody with that serious injury can ever come back and do something significant in the sport. But not Maria. She looked at herself and said, okay, so physically I cannot play tennis, so I'm going to work on my mental toughness. So for a year, she worked on being tough mentally. She worked on creating a resolve in her mind that when she comes back after 12 months, she's going to come back with a vengeance, and she is going to reclaim that number one position in the world. And guess what? She comes back in 2010, in 2012, She's back to being the number one tennis player in the women's tennis in the world. Do you think she allowed her experience to define her or destroy her? Or do you think she took that experience and let it strengthen her? What do you think? Strengthen her, right? So ask yourself, when something bad happens to you, do you let that incident, that event, define you or destroy you, or you become stronger because of that event? And the last question you should ask is, how can I benefit others from what I have learned through this experience? When we are only thinking about ourselves, we are miserable. But as soon as we start thinking about helping others, we are happier. You know, Angelina Jolie, her mother passed away when she was only 56 years old of cancer. And so Angelina Jolie knew that she is at risk of dying of breast cancer as well. So she decided to go through the gene testing to find out if she has that faulty gene that could increase her chances of having breast cancer. So she goes through that, 
And sure enough, she finds it that yes, she has the faulty gene that increased her chance of getting breast cancer by almost 87%. So proactively, she goes through double mastectomy. Now, you ask anybody, typically it is such a private matter for a woman that they're not gonna put this out on a blog or on the social media and say, hey, look, I just went through double mastectomy. They would like to keep that private. It's such a private matter, but not Angelina. She thought there are so many other women in the world who may be going through the same thing, who may be at risk of getting breast cancer as well. So what did she do? She wrote an op-ed column in New York Times sharing her such a personal story with the rest of the world just because she wanted to help others from the experience she went through. And these are just the last two paragraphs of what that article was, and it's a really beautiful two, three lines. I would like to read it real quickly. She wrote, I chose not to keep my story private because there are many women who do not know that they might be living under the shed of cancer. It is my hope that they too will be able to get gene tested and that if they have a high risk, they too will know that they have strong options. Life comes with many challenges. The ones that should not scare us are the ones we can take on and take control of. So next time you go through a misfortune, embrace your reality, ask yourself, how can this strengthen me? And number three, ask yourself, how can I help others from the experience that I have gained? The last secret is share your bliss. This is about contributing to the world. This is about giving back to the world. One of my favorite quotes is from Howard Thurman. It's a beautiful quote. He said, don't ask the world what it needs from you, but ask yourself what makes you come alive and go do that because what the world needs are more people who have come alive. Don't ask the world what it needs from you. Instead, ask yourself what makes you come alive and go do that because what the world needs is more people who have come alive. So when I talk about sharing your beliefs, I'm not talking about you should be going out and giving money away or material things away. This secret is about sharing your beliefs. This is about sharing your God-given talents and gifts with people around you. And you look at all the successful people, they all have this secret in common. Mani Pacquiao. I know we hear a lot about his colorful life, but we often don't hear about the amount of time he spends with young boxers coming from poor families, mentoring him and teaching them. One of the first things he did when he got money was to go and buy that LM gene, the run-down gene in St. Paulok, and now he has turned that into a state-of-the-art boxing gene and a dormitory, MP Tower. Many boxers stay there for free because they cannot afford it. Lea Salonga, you hear about her singing for free at the concerts for raising money for Yolanda Typhoon or any other natural calamities. She raises funds for breast cancer awareness in the Philippines. Janet Delano, when she came back from climbing Mount Everest, she didn't go and start making money. She spent months and months going around the country talking to kids in all the schools she can to share her inspiring story, to share with other Filipino kids that you can also dream big and achieve your dreams. We heard from Attorney Roy. He's a lawyer for a year. 
He could be making a lot of money. He could be charging people hourly rate. Yet, every week, he takes six hours off, and he's sitting at the legal assistance desk at the Adamson University, waiting for poor people to come in who cannot afford a lawyer. So ask yourself, how can you share your bliss with this world? Maybe your bliss is singing or dancing. Well, don't wait until the voice, the Philippines, or the PGT calls you to perform on TV. Go and find a local orphanage and spend an hour a week teaching these kids how to sing, how to dance. Right? Maybe your bliss is accounting. Well, don't try to be the BS accountant working at PwC or any other accounting firms. Go to a local NGO, the legit one, not the... <laughs> and see if they need some help with bookkeeping. Maybe your bliss is to become a news anchor. You want to be the next Karen Davila. Well, don't wait until a TV station calls you with an offer. If you think there is a social issue in the Philippines that needs to be addressed, go and make a movie or a documentary about it and post it on YouTube and share it with your friends on social media. We all have incredible potential to make this world a better place without spending a dime, just simply sharing our bliss, simply sharing our shining self with the world around us. So take a couple of minutes here. Think about how can you, starting today, start sharing your bliss with others. So I want to leave you with this final, very brief story from the life of Shaquille O'Neal. You know, when Shaquille O'Neal was in uh, high school, his mom sent him to attend a basketball camp. And in, in his own high school, he was the best basketball player, basketball player there was. He was the fastest, he was the biggest, he was the most talented. But this is the first time at this camp he meets other basketball players coming from other high schools. And he realizes that so many of them are better than him, bigger than him, faster than him, more talented than him. And his confidence in him is shaken. He wondered for a minute whether he could really have a shot at having a career in basketball. So he comes home dejected, discouraged. His mom asks him, Shaq, how's the basketball camp? And he said, Mom, I don't think basketball is my thing. Maybe I will try that later in life. And his mom said, but son, later doesn't happen for everybody. Later doesn't happen for everybody. So I'll ask you this, what are you postponing to later in your life? And what if that later doesn't happen for you? Thank you very much. Thank you.